welcome to Bible Shots. Um, sex, like uh, unlike any other thing really, uh, there's not much else that you could say has been more uh, in the realm of you do you than sex. And uh, uh, for many people, we've gone from all sorts of different ideas about what should and shouldn't be uh, okay in the sexual realm to uh, whatever happens between two consensual adults is all fine. Uh, but is it? Does that really cut the mustard in terms of our sexual ethics? Has the Bible got something useful to say about this? Uh, well, uh, welcome to Bible Shots. It's great to have you here. Uh, we spend a bit of time uh, midweek to uh, have a look at what the Bible has to say about a contemporary topic uh, and uh, to reinvigorate you and see you uh, moving on into your afternoon. Uh, with uh, the ideas fresh in mind and uh, ready to take on the rest of the week. Uh, this is a, an event for people who are believers and unbelievers alike. And uh, before we get into our today's topic, I'd like to talk a bit about our speaker. Uh, Steve uh, lives in Perth, uh, but don't hold that against him. Uh, he, uh, <clears throat> he also uh, is a writer, a, a, a speaker, uh, a pastor, a runner, uh, father, uh, husband, and uh, yeah, we could keep going on, couldn't we? Um, <clears throat> you don't have to. <laughs> don't have to. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, if you'd like to join with me, I'm going to put my uh, the Bible passage up today. Uh, it's uh, from First Corinthians, chapter six. So. Share as well. Wait. Okay. First Corinthians chapter six, verses fifteen to twenty. If you have your own Bible, you might like to uh, look on uh, as we read. But it's First Corinthians chapter six, verses fifteen to twenty. And it says, "Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never." Do you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. And whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, God, honour God with your bodies. A nice, simple, straightforward passage there. And I'm sure many of you have already got questions burning in your mind. Um, if you want to go down to the bottom of uh, the, the Q&A section there, you can ask a question if you like. Or if you're watching on Facebook, uh, then just put it in the comments and uh, a question will be put through to us um, as we go. Uh, but... Uh, Without any further ado, Steve, away you go. Thanks very much, uh, Scott. Good to be with you all here today. We're doing our second in the uh, series of You Do You, which looks at the freedom that we think we have in our culture to be who we want to be and to curate a life uh, that uh, sort of makes us the most authentic you or me that I could possibly be. And it's central to our modern uh, mindset. It's an article of faith almost, the autonomy that we have as individuals. And the foundation stone of it is the idea of freedom, personal freedom, which we looked at last week. And I said we would use that foundation stone to build uh, three uh, weeks or three topics on what our society uh, builds upon that foundation stone. Now, it's not an exhaustive list, but it is one that uh, picks up some of the, uh, uh, I guess, the things that ring our bells today in our culture. And sexual freedom is probably perhaps the one that is really most key in, these, in this setting, I think. Um, Sexual freedom, who I am in terms of activity and identity, so activity on one hand and identity on the other, is a decision for me to come to uh, within the boundaries of consent. And sex is the hot button issue, sex and gender and identity in our culture today. There's no way of getting around that. Now, we should have seen this train coming down the line. And uh, Dale Kuhn in his book, Sex in the Eye World, it's a great book. It's a few years old now, but he really saw what was going on. The eye world is he calls the individual world. Uh, he was having a discussion in the 1980s as a young professor at university, and he asked a colleague, 
what matters most to Americans? What would you uh, touch in a, the life of people in, the, in America, or by that extension in the West, that would most get people upset? His friend posed that question to him and uh, Dale said, money, if you touch people's money, they'll get really upset. And his friend said, sorry, you're wrong. Sexual freedom is the number one issue. Any politician who seeks to restrict sexual freedom will die a very painful political death. Now you'd have to say, who's been proven right in the last 30 to 40 years? It's uh, definitely uh, his friend, isn't it? That sexual freedom is the issue. And what I'm doing in these talks is giving, uh, it's sort of like a, a game of two halves. 50% of the time to discuss in the issue, and then 50% of the time uh, sort of rubbing the Bible against the topic and seeing where the sparks fly. So that's what we're gonna to do today with sexual freedom. And uh, Dale Kuhn goes on to say this, the I world is predicated on a foundational belief that the expansion of individual rights will lead to increased happiness and fulfillment. And you've got to say, nowhere else is that seen more clearly than in sex. We're putting that foundational belief or theory through the most rigorous testing regime possible. Because the ultimate promise of this freedom is to do with your body, what you do with it, the way you shape it, and how you use it. That is our, uh, our hope of, uh, I guess, transcendence, to loose ourselves from the, the surly bonds of uh, our averageness, so to speak, <laughs> and become who we were destined to be. Now, I want to show you uh, an incredible, well, I think it's an incredible statement on the back of a photograph that is equally incredible. Um, this is a photo of uh, Caitlyn Jenner, who formerly was known as Bruce Jenner. And this is a quote from Vice magazine in 2016, when Bruce Jenner came out as a woman after having suffered gender dysphoria for much of uh, his younger life. And this is what it said in Vice magazine, the moon landing, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Once in every American generation comes a moment that changes the world forever. And for millennials, that moment came last night. For millennials, that moment came last night. Now that's a big statement, isn't it? That's a massive statement. Uh, I wanna unpack it a little bit that the boomers were uh, looking for reality or truth up there. The moon landing was about there's some there's truth out there somewhere that I'm aiming for or looking for or looking to find. And next generation, uh, that's my generation, the fall of the Berlin Wall, we were saying, well, we're not looking up there. We're looking for truth in our bigger, wider, open, barriered community. The walls are falling down. Millennials, says this article, are not looking for truth out there or across there their vision has withered or narrowed and internalized to within me. And Bruce Jenner went from the pinnacle of manhood in 1976 when he won the gold medal at the Montreal Olympics for the decathlon to the pinnacle of womanhood where he is named, Caitlyn Jenner is named woman of the year in Vanity Fair magazine. That's a huge shift in 40 years. The same person is man of the year and woman of the year in the same time period. Absolutely astonishing. See, the locus of freedom is not something out there, uh, what something transcendent can offer you or something that the community can offer you, but what something within me can offer me. And that's where my true authenticity lies, if I can find it. Now, that's a big if, isn't it? That's a, that's a massive statement that, uh, that you can curate your life to such an extent freedom of sexual activity, that's within consent, and freedom of sexual identity, no coercion to be who you don't think you are. And that is seen as the path to true liberty. That is seen as the path to you do you. Now, that all sounds well and good, but the flip side to that is this. If this project goes wrong, since it's you do you, the only person you have to blame is, well, you. <laughs> if it doesn't do the trick for you, then how much more can you change? How much more can you change of yourself to be able to get the authentic self happening? And you'd have to say with the level of anxiety in our culture at the moment, that, and with the fact that we have a mental health tsunami in Australia, the whole You Do You project is actually struggling, uh, struggling with these things. So what does the Bible, the Christian view, have to say in this topic? Well, a few things before I go there and look at what the Bible passage actually says. Um, 
It's often claimed that the Bible and sex don't mix. And uh, even though the era of the New Testament in particular was one of the most sexualized eras ever with pagan temples and rituals, it's sort of seen that the Bible, you know, is a bit squeamish about sex. But if you're not a Christian here today, then the reading that we had from 1 Corinthians 6 that Scott read to us is a super challenging read. As you read it, you think there's no way that could lead to my freedom. In fact, it doesn't seem to be talking about freedom sexually or anyway. But if you're a Christian here today and you're uh, reading that passage, uh, would you start here with a friend who was not a Christian? Would you start with that passage and say, I want to show you some really good news? Uh, I'm not sure you would because of what it says. It's so confronting. Now, I want to give you some context about the passage that we're looking at from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's a letter by Paul to a church in Corinth. And look, never mind lingerie shops and supermarkets, uh, with very suggestive photographs, it, uh, Corinth was the place to go if you wanted to see sex in your face. It was prostitutes at local temples at 20 paces. And a bunch of people had become Christians in this very licentious city, Corinth. And uh, they're, they're not quite sure how to put life together now that they've started following Jesus. But they're a little bit flippant about what it means to be a Christian in some areas. And one of them is to do with, um, can I do what I want? And the starting statement of this passage is a quote by them. All things are lawful for me. They're writing a letter to Paul who writes back to them. And they're saying, what I do with my body surely doesn't matter. It's the spiritual bit inside the sort of the shell that's important. And in one sense, they've drunk the Kool-Aid of Corinth, that your body is just something that you can do what you like with because to really be true and right with yourself and with God and the universe, it's the spirit bit that has to be released from the body. So don't worry what you do with your body. And so they were saying, all things are lawful for me. It doesn't really matter. But Paul goes on to say, aha, maybe all things are lawful for you. And he goes on to say, but I will not be dominated by anything. And he uses the example of food. Food's for the stomach and the stomach for food. But God would destroy them both. And what he's really getting at isn't just stomachs and foods, he's getting at appetites. When we say all things are lawful for me, we're saying, I am in control of my appetites, I do what I wish. And straight away, Paul goes, ah, uh -uh, got to think about this. But this is a freedom issue. On one hand, they're saying, I can do anything, I'm free to do that. And Paul counters with this, what you think is liberating will actually enslave and dominate you. And at just a cursory glance, you'd have to say that's true of sex. For all the talk of sex and sexual freedom in our culture, porn addiction, sex trafficking, illicit relationships that destroy marriages, sexual violence, they're on the front page of our papers. They're the issues that people are dealing with. Perhaps some of those issues are things that you're dealing with as well. You see, for all of the expert in the 21st century about sex, we're not actually that good at managing sex once we say we're free and that we get to choose which boundaries we cross because boundaries get crossed that shouldn't get crossed. And what Paul does, central to his argument in this passage, is to show that the body really, really matters and what you do with it and who you do it with really, really matters, especially around sex. And the first four verses are really important that uh, were read to us. It says in verse 14, the body of 13, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you get that? In Corinth, where it was said that the body doesn't matter, you can do what you like with it, and it's just about your spirit. God raises Jesus' body. <laughs> God raises Jesus' body to say, actually, bodies do matter. The gods in the ancient world didn't, they took on human bodies from time to time, it was thought, but they dumped them at the end when they'd done their dirty work because it was ugh, yucky. But God's saying here, bodies are significant good things because they really, really matter. And I proved that by raising Jesus from the dead. And he says to these Corinthians, Paul says, and God will prove that even further by raising your bodies from the dead. Now, that's a, that's a huge issue in Christianity. I think most people uh, don't necessarily reject Christianity for, you know, for lots of reasons people reject Christianity, but the whole idea of the body being raised seems as crazy to 21st century people and all their modern ways 
as it did to pagan Corinthians. But here's the point. The guts of the Christian message is not we go to heaven when we die as if we're some piece of uh, sort of spiritual cling film floating around in the clouds with a harp. The guts of the Christian message is this. God will, because he raised Jesus bodily, raise us bodily, and we will take part in a new creation of which Jesus is the first part of that new creation in his raised body. And the implication in this passage is clear. Paul calls on these Christians to run away from illicit sex, run away from thinking that your body is the thing you can just do what you like with. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Now, maybe you're not into prostitution. Maybe you're not into that at all. But in Paul's day, prostitution was seen as part of the worship system. And they, the people of Corinth were worshipping uh, very well because the temple prostitutes were there to use. And the Christian community had been suckered into that. And Paul says, do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? flee or run from sexual immorality. You see, on this point about the body and sex and the body, Paul has no argument with modern thinking. Sex really is about the deepest parts of you. It really is. Paul isn't saying, oh, it doesn't really matter. He's going, if you sin sexually, if you do something that is against God's will sexually, you're sinning against your body. It's the one sin he says that's about the body. But it's where Paul goes with that next that is totally at odds with the culture that he's in and the culture that we're in today. And the thing he says is a banger. It's a huge issue and one that our modern world will find all too confronting. And perhaps you find it a bit confronting as I say it today. From my experience, it's the one thing that makes people walk away from Christianity. You either never go there, say that's too hard a message to hear, or you walk away from the message for the sake of rejecting it. And it's in verses 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Here's the kicker. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your bodies. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Now, never mind sex. That strikes at the very heart of the freedom matter, doesn't it? That cuts with a sword the idea of you do you. And it uses the issue of sex to show that. Paul is saying, you don't belong to you. <laughs> you were bought with a price. <laughs> so glorify God. In other words, seek his interests for your body, not your own interests for your body. Not your own interests for your body. The first thing I want to point out in this passage that's completely the opposite of what our culture would say is this. Uh, you are not your own. You are not your own. Now, as opposed to what? Is it as opposed to you are your own? <laughs> well, let me knock that idea down for a start. The, the, the cultural currents that we swim in, that we don't even see that we're swimming in, help us and make us think exactly like just so much of the culture. We're not our own anyway. <laughs> I, I just want you to grasp that thought that, uh, you know, people say if you were born in a 19th century Madagascar setting, you wouldn't be Christian here today, as if to say your culture is shaping you to be a Christian. Yes, but I'd answer that by saying if you were born in 19th century Madagascar, you wouldn't be a modern liberal secular person who thinks that all paths are equally true and none at the same time. That's just the culture we swim in. You can't accuse someone else of being culturally bound or bonded without facing the accusation yourself. It calls for a level of humility in us to say, am I really my own? Am I just me do me in this world in which so many things are imposing on me? But the second thing, and it springs from this in this passage, is Paul says, you, you were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. That immediately says, well, I'm not my own, but it sounds like slavery. <laughs> but in this passage, Paul isn't just hearkening back to slaves being bought in the marketplace, as some people may have said. He's hearkening back to a story where slaves in Egypt, God's people, the Jews, were bought at a price by God that God paid. 
that it was even paid in the death of a lamb during Passover and seen in the death of the firstborn of Israel in the story back in Exodus. They were bought with a price and redeemed from slavery to a liberty that they could scarcely believe. They had to enact the liberty that God won for them by buying them with a price. So it isn't just that you're bought into slavery, it's saying you're bought from slavery to something else. And Bob Dylan said it well in that famous song, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you're serving somebody. So the question is, when you think about you do you, and you think about the sexual freedom question, who are you serving? Are you serving yourself? <laughs> and I'd have to say, really? <laughs> How differently do you think the you do you sexual freedom idea is to anything that Netflix puts up or Google or Facebook or whatever. No one is ever their own, ever. Everyone has been bought with a price. Here's the rub, here's the question. What price do you put on yourself? <laughs> Perhaps you're selling yourself too cheaply. This passage tells us that God values us so much that the price that was paid for our liberty was the death of his son in our place. Our cultural problem isn't that we're free, it's that we sell ourselves too cheaply. We will allow ourselves to be bound by anything, including sex, for the price of a subscription. The third thing to say and the final thing is that it says glorify God with your body. And the Bible and this passage tells us that you're going to glorify something or someone. Glory simply means to give weight or attend, full time and attention to something, give ultimate meaning to something. And the question in our context is, what are we giving ultimate meaning to? Is it able to bear the weight of glory, so to speak, of our expectations? Here's the problem with anything, including sex, that is not able to bear that weight. Whatever we idolize or we hold up as the thing that will solve our lives, when it lets us down, we demonize it. Whatever we idolize, we demonize. And the Bible promise is that God is good and powerful and can carry the weight of our expectations. Let me finish with a quote. It's a famous quote by a man called David Foster Wallace, who spoke this as part of a commencement address at a liberal arts college in the United States to a bunch of young people who were going out to experience the sexual freedom and to sell it as those who were the marketing creative geniuses of the next generation. And he says this, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what we worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if that's where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Sobering words from a man who was an atheist. You see, we're never our own. Never. We've all got a price. We're never just you do you, even and especially when it comes to sex. And I want to leave you the question, uh, will you trade your freedom for sex or are you already doing that? What would true freedom sexually actually look like? Have you given yourself away too cheaply? And the Bible says there's a freedom available to us in our bodies that is beyond our wildest dreams and beyond anything that sex could give us. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks, Steve. Are you selling yourself too cheaply? It's a powerful thought. Well, we're going to have uh, a few questions now. We might start with one that was asked last week that we didn't get to, um, and that was uh, concerning freedom um, and election, the idea in the Bible that uh, God predestines people, chooses people. How does freedom, Steve, work in with that concept? Well, I think uh, the actually, actually the sex idea works into it well, that it, it, the foundational understanding of that question is that we are free to begin with, which I'm not sure that the Bible would say that we are free to begin with. In fact, it would say the opposite, that 
uh, the freedom that God gives us is a freedom from a deficit, not that we're in a neutral position. And I think the idea of, and it was talked about election, uh, God choosing, um, is in some senses, uh, we don't experience that God choosing as us, not as us sort of being robotic in our response to God. Everything we do, we're making considered choices in. And it's also in the sense that if we are just material beings and just scientifically put together, and that's all there is to us, materialists, and everything in our brains is just synapses firing at certain levels, we have no personal uh, autonomy anyway. That would just say we're the sum total of the things that are happening to us beyond our own measure. So I think it's a slight false dichotomy that either we're free or we're chosen like this. I think um, that's probably too big a, a dichotomy to make. I do think that uh, the decisions we make are real decisions. And what I do think too, is that sometimes we think we're choosing freedom when we're not, we're choosing something else. So that's a, a quick wrap up of last week's question, but thanks for the person who asked it. But if there are any questions on sex or freedom and what that means today and why it's such a hot button topic, happy to hear those. Fantastic. We've got another question here. How does the church glorify Christ when they commit sexual abuse of the vulnerable? Well, I don't think they do glorify Christ by committing sexual abuse and the great shame on the church uh, in areas of the church, not all of the church, is that they have looked too much like the rest of the world because uh, those things going on shouldn't be going on in the very place that has said, we believe that we are not our own, that we're bought with a price. So I think it brings great shame on the church. Um, I think there's enough in us as uh, those who've been created by God to know that certain things are wrong. But for those who belong to the people who say that they are the uh, made new by Christ, it's, it's a terrible indictment. And what we're seeing is um, an unfolding of that, not just in the church, obviously, uh, just this week, the Boy Scouts in the US, huge sexual immorality or sexual abuse cases going on uh, down the years. You've got Hollywood, all these things, which show that human beings, unless we are extremely aware of the lack of, uh, that, that we need a freedom from God rather than something that we do ourselves, we're in trouble, even in the church, I would say. Thanks, Dave. Uh, another question here, uh, is rejecting God for pleasures of the flesh not like Esau selling his birthright for a bowl of stew? The story from Genesis chapter 25 where Esau sells uh, his birthright to Jacob. Uh, you got a comment on that one? Yeah, look, I think the complexity of, uh, of uh, all of those things is that we, um, the good gifts that we have, once they're made something that are greater than the best gift, uh, replaces them as the object of our affections. So I think the issue of sex itself is that sex is a signpost that points to a destination. And too many people use it as the destination in life. I think the way we understand sex and intimacy and relationships is supposed to point us beyond ourselves to a greater intimacy that God has for us that when we arrive at in the new creation, won't sort of make sex sort of a side issue. It'll make it redundant. It will be a level of intimacy that will make sex seem like a shadow, which you can't see on this side of it. But that's true of everything. That thing that I want or that lifestyle I'm craving or that job that I think is going to do it for me is an idol and it can, it, idols work occasionally, but eventually they will start to let you down. And then you start to scrabble harder to try and get them to do what you want it to do. And the, more, the harder you push, the less they deliver until eventually you're serving the idol, the idol's not serving you. I think that's how I would see anything like sex or experience or work or any of those things that become those idol things. But I think Esau didn't trade his birthright for something bad. He traded it for something deficient, not something bad. Thanks, Dave. Um, another question. Um, you said that uh, this is about being in control of our appetites, hmm. uh, whether it be food or sex or, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, but is, is my appetite something separate from me or is that truly who I am? Um, well, it, are, you, you're, are you just the sum total of your appetites? Uh, no, I, I don't think you're a head on a stick either. 
<laughs> I think uh, uh, we, we, we love certain things but because we're created to, to desire them. It's, it's disordered desire that's the problem, which is why when you read the fruit of the spirit in the book of Galatians, one of them is self-control. And in some things, we like self-control. We like athletes who are self-controlled so that come March next year when they run under the paddock, they don't look like they've been out to pasture for too long. Um, but on other things, we go self-control is bad. But the Bible says we're into self-control, not because uh, desire is bad, uh, but because desire becomes disordered. Any disordered desire is a thing. It de the, everything is addictive. But because I, I think we're meant to desire and we're meant to desire ultimately uh, the one who created us to desire. God didn't sort of make a mistake and put desire in us and then spend the rest of the creation trying to figure out how to make us cool, dispassionate people. We're not aiming to be Buddhists, okay? Christianity is not the same as Buddhism because it says go hard on desire, just order it the right way. Good stuff. Well, I think we've uh, hit our time. Uh, it's great to have, have you, Steve, and Thanks. have you speak these last two weeks. Next two weeks, uh, Steve will be continuing in this Just You Do You series and uh, looking at pleasure and spirituality. So look forward to that one. Uh, thanks for being a, a part of today's uh, big, uh, sorry, not big questions, um, Bible shots. And uh, we hope to see you next week. See you later. Thanks, people. Thank you.